Every one of you have issues in your life. <laughs> you don't have to tell me. I don't have to guess. You got issues. Every one of us, and in every culture it's the same. You can check it out with Lloyd's parents and see if it's true in Zimbabwe. But in every culture, everyone has the same issues. One, first issue. Everybody wants to know somewhere along the line, am I loved? The second issue is, does my life matter? And I just want to say boldly, your life matters to God. And in Luke chapter 15, Jesus was hanging around with people and uh, the pastors and teachers of religion of that day were saying, hey Jesus, don't you know you're hanging out with sinners? And uh, Jesus went on to tell a few stories about how important every one is. And uh, the, the uh, story of the lost sheep, the story of the lost coin, and of course the most famous story most of us know, we call it the prodigal son. But really it's about a prodigal God. He's an extravagant God and he's big enough, he cares about every person. So situation or issue number two, turn to the person next to you and say, you really got some big, big issues. Just tell them you got some big issues. <laughs> That's enough. First issue, am I loved? Second issue, does my life matter? Third issue is why is my life empty? And everybody's life is, if you boil it down, whether they'll acknowledge, everybody's life is empty without Jesus Christ because he is the one that created everything and holds it all together. The fourth issue in your life is uh, what do I do with my guilt? How many here have ever done wrong or have any faults in your life have ever should we say sin? Could I see your hand? How many know of anybody in the room that has sinned before? And uh, that's true. So everybody has an issue with guilt. Fifth, everybody has to be healed from your hurts. Every, we all struggle at one point or another, at one place or another, we all struggle with bitterness because we've been hurt by other people, every one of us. And then the last issue of life is that I've seen many times in hospital rooms and coming along the sick, side of the sick and people have a fear of death a fear of death and I just want to tell you Jesus God's son deals with every one of those issues but the big one we're going to deal with today is number four what do I do with my guilt and I'm going to begin a series on the seven words of Christ from the cross I'm going to start the series and I have no idea when I will go on with the series but this will be part one Several months ago, I ordered up some books from various pastors, and so these are all books that cover the seven words of Jesus that he spoke when he was on the cross. We're going to just take the first one today. And Jesus' first words from the cross was, Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. And 2,000 years ago, when they killed Jesus, they had no clue. Yes, they knew what was going on in the natural, but they had no clue. They were committing the greatest crime in the history of the world. They killed God's son. How many know that your body was not designed or created to carry guilt? If you try to carry guilt very long, it begins to tear you down. In fact, it is reported that many people would be out of the hospitals if they could just get rid of their guilt. It hurts our bodies, it hurts our minds, it hurts our relationships. We have fears of rejection, we fear retaliation. Guilt is a terrible thing. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he was the author of the Sherlock Holmes series. It is reported that years ago, one time, he sent anonymous notes to all of his friends, 50 guys, 50 men in England. And the simple anonymous note said, all is found out, flee at once. Within 24 hours, half of those 50 had left the country. It is a terrible thing to have to carry guilt in our lives. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Anybody you know of got any guilt in their lives? Feel guilty about anything? The most wonderful thing in the world, the most amazing truth in the world, the most wonderful, wonderful thing is that God created you because he wanted to have a relationship with you. 
God created me, believe it or not, because he wanted a relationship with me. God created Adam and Eve because he wanted to share his love with them. He wanted a relationship with them. You were made to be friends of God. How many know that's true? It is true. You were made to be a friend of God. You were created to be loved by God. It's why you and I are here on this earth. But there is a problem. What is the problem? The problem is with my sin and with your sin and with Adam and Eve. They broke relationship. And the base sin was they thought they should be the center of the universe. Now, I found that to be very easy for me growing up. I'm the center of the universe, right? That's, I'm the big deal here. My sin and your sin is what causes the break in our relationship with God. Does that make sense? It's not just about if I can get this sin taken care of, if I can get this person taken care of. I think I should do it on my own. I know better. I decide what I'm going to do. I, I decide what's best for me. God doesn't understand all my issues, and we reject God outright. We broke relationship with God. Every problem on the planet at the root is a problem in relationships. Every problem we have on this planet is a problem with relationships. And even though you and I and every person in every culture, we've done our own thing, gone our own way, God says, I will step in and I will try to connect with you and love you where you are and I will make a bridge between me and you so that we can be rejoined and have a relationship together. So God sent his son Jesus he took the initiative. We call it amazing grace. God sent his son to become one of us that he might show us his love. He might provide for our issues and we might be reconnected in a relationship with God. If I were to summarize this book in one word, the Bible, I would use the word relationship. Now, a lot of people say they are Christian, but they don't know anything about a relationship with God. But God wanted you and me to have a relationship with him. And Jesus is the connecting point for that relationship. So, God sent his only son, not to condemn the world, but, but through, that through him, through Jesus, the world might be saved. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was arrested late at night. He was put through six different trials that night. All of them were illegal trials. Three were civil and three were religious trials. And then he was presented before people. They rejected him. He was stripped and beaten and suffering. And then we pick up where Jesus is in the story in Luke chapter 23. And I didn't put it on your notes because I had too many notes. So I'm going to read it to you. Jesus has been rejected and beaten and sentenced. And it says, great crowds trailed along behind Jesus including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with Jesus. And finally, they came to a place called the Skull. All three were crucified there, Jesus on the center cross and the two criminals on either side. And then Jesus said, this was his first words from the cross. In fact, it is implied in the text, in the scriptures, that he was praying this ongoing when he got to the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. As the crowd stood watching, the leaders laughed and scoffed at Jesus. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he really is God's chosen one, the Messiah. The soldiers mocked him too and offered him a drink of sour wine. And then they called out to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And Jesus said no. Why did he say no to saving himself? Because he wasn't on the cross for him. He was on the cross to save you and me. That's why Jesus took the suffering and the rejection and the death. 
because he wanted to demonstrate to us and to provide for us salvation. In fact, Jesus said, um, I have come to seek and to save what was lost. And through Jesus' life, you have the opportunity to be recovered. How many need to be recovered? So, we all have sinned and fallen short. We've all made mistakes. We've all had faults. Uh, but we always have excuses, right? So I'm going to just cover quickly this morning uh, a couple things. One is, what do we try to do with our guilt? Another is, what should we do with our guilt? And the last one is, what does Jesus do with our guilt? So follow along, fill in the blanks, and Lord help me that I don't take you till tonight. Here we go. What do we usually try to do with our guilt when we do something wrong? How many here have been a follower of Christ? You've committed your life to Jesus for more than five years. Could I see your hand? So let me just ask you a question. Do you ever realize that you've sinned at, since you've accepted Jesus? Yes. Now, any of you that never realized that you sinned since you've accepted Jesus? Yeah. Well, come talk to me later. I know you're a little embarrassed. <laughs> but if you'll just come up and share with me, I would be grateful. What do, we try to, what do we try to do with our guilt? Number one, write it down, we try to bury our sins. We try to bury our sins. Now, as I said a minute ago, our bodies are not wired to carry guilt. We do everything we can to kind of put it aside. But let me just tell you something. When you bury your guilt, your stomach keeps score. When you bury your guilt, guilt always has a resurrection. It will come back on you. Am I right, Steve? If you try to push it down, not that he has a problem with sin. I'm just talking about us. See, I, this is really wonderful. Here's what David said. When I refused to confess my sin, I was weak and miserable, and I groaned all day long. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, self, I will confess, I put that in. I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Anybody ever remember the old Rolaids commercial? How many are old enough? Uh, nobody remembers that. Boy, Ray, we are getting old. So, how do you spell relief? F O R G I V E N. Forgiven. Forgiven. We try to bury our guilt. What are some ways that we do it? How do we try to bury our guilt? Well, number one, we try it by minimizing our guilt. Um, when my mom, when I was little, would catch me doing something I shouldn't be doing, what would I respond to her with? Well, mom, it's not that big a deal. I would try to minimize the issue. And she would maximize it. <laughs> the second thing we try to do is we try to rationalize. And uh, this is, oh man, is this common ground? We don't say it out loud when we get older, we just think it. And the reason we do what we do is we say, well, everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. And my mom would always say, who's everybody? <laughs> we rationalize and then we compromise. You know, I, I don't feel bad about it anymore. If you keep doing the same sin or sins over and over again, you get kind of like a callus, like playing a guitar, and you go, that's not so big, bad a deal. There was a fortune cookie, and I, I usually don't read the fortune in the fortune cookie, because some of it, and, and please forgive me if you make fortune cookies, but some of them are just wacky, just wacky. So here's the one from a fortune cookie. It says, commit a sin twice, and it won't seem like a sin to you anymore. And that's exactly what happens when we sin. If you keep pounding it, you'll compromise and say, well, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Proverbs 28, 13 says, you will never succeed if, in life if you try to hide your sins. So we try to bury our sins. Got that one? What's another thing we do to deal with our guilt and our shame and our sins? Number two, we blame other people. We blame others. We blame others. Now, this isn't new. This is common, and it's common since the beginning of the planet and the beginning of people. And God one day came down to 
see Adam and Eve, and it was a wonderful relationship they had. Can you imagine? I can't even get it. They've got this beautiful, beautiful garden. It's just everything's, uh, I learned a new word this week. Actually, it's not new. I just got rid of it. Copacetic. Anybody know copacetic? Copacetic. What in the world is that? Is that like a medicine or something? Anyway, copacetic means in excellent order. Everything was copacetic. But Adam and Eve thought they knew better, so they ate of the forbidden fruit. So God comes down to Adam and says, have you eaten fruit from the tree I warned you about? And Adam said, yes. But it was the woman you gave me who brought me some of the fruit, and I ate it. <laughs> and we men have never changed. We take it like a man and blame our wives. God, we were doing just fine here, you and me, and then you brought me this little temptress. <laughs> so let me ask you a question this morning. For any guilt that you might be carrying in your life, who are you blaming for that? Do you know, when I was little, my parents held my head under the sink for too long, and therefore, I'm just weird. You know, we are a victim of, we are a nation of victims. It's not my responsibility, it's because somebody else did something to me, and that's why I don't take responsibility for me. Because if you'd had to live with my parents, We are pros at accusing others and excusing ourselves. Would you agree with that? Yes. We're pros. We can accuse other people on the spot and excuse ourselves. We apply the law to other people and the grace of God to us. We give them justice and judgment and we take mercy for us. Blaming, when we blame others, it's a sign of guilt. And then if we blame long enough, ultimately it circles back because we blame our creator. Some people ruin themselves by their own stupid actions. And I just ask you a question. How many here, if you reflect on your life, you go, man, there was some stupid actions there looking back. How many had any stupid actions in your past? Oh, man, you think about it today, you go, ah, what was I thinking? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So we try to bury our guilt. We try to blame others. A third way we try to deal with our guilt is we beat ourselves up. We beat ourselves up. David said, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a load. It weighs me down because I was foolish. I, I'm bent over and bowed down and I'm sad all day long. Do you know, uh, of course, guilt causes sickness. But uh, I have a problem when I keep uh, going in the wrong direction, there's faults in my life, there's a pattern of sin, and my conscience takes over. Now, the problem with your conscience and mine is our conscience doesn't know when to quit. So let me give you a little example. I, I know some of you. I know your stories. I'm going to tell those stories before the morning's out. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Some of you, if you were to close your eyes and think about your past, you would be feeling bad about things that happened months ago. You ever get caught in those quiet moments and you go, oh man, wish I had that to do over again. Some of you would not go back months, you'd go back years. And some of you could go back decades. And you're still beating yourself up over that thing that you did wrong. That decision you made, that direction you took, and you go, oh, uh, uh, uh. God has a better idea than us beating ourselves up. So we try to take our guilt. How are you doing so far? What do we do? We try to bury our guilt. We blame others. Is there anybody here you'd like to blame? Just point them out. And uh, we try to, we beat ourselves up. We beat ourselves up. So what does Jesus want us to do with our guilt? What does Jesus want us to do with our guilt? The steps that Jesus has for us are simple. But I'm just going to tell you up front, it is not easy. And let me tell you as well. Most people that are following Jesus, 
very few deal with their guilt going forward. They still, yeah, I've got this covered. Jesus has forgiven my sin, my sins. I, I, back here, I, I had this thing covered. But going forward, you still had some issues. You got some things you got to work out. And we go, we don't know what to do with those. We, and we don't. We don't. In fact, uh, many times we become like the pastors and teachers of religion. The Pharisees, I mean, they were not pastors. They weren't pastors. Uh, the Pharisees and religious people. And we kind of get this attitude that we kind of look down at people. You, you sinners. Boy, I'm sitting amongst. You know what? You're just sitting among a bunch of sinners. Just look down your nose at them. Uh, and uh, you can be sure you got a problem if you're looking at other people in a kind of crosswise view because they're, they got problems. Oh, man, they got problems. I'm glad I've been redeemed. So what do we do with our problems? How do we handle our guilt? Well, first thing is we have to admit we, we may have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Now, I put in your notes, may have a problem, and I want you to put a big X through that and say, you do have a problem. We have to admit that we have a problem. We have to face the problem and not run from the problem. I think it was a year or two ago, and some of you are acquainted with the painter of lights, Thomas Kincaid. And just uh, within the last couple of years, he, he died at age 54, way too young. What was Kincaid's problem? His service problem was alcohol, and he would never face the issues of his life. He always ran, and his answer was alcohol. And so he drank himself to death at age 54. That's because he was always trying to run from it and never face the issues of his life. Does that make sense? Proverbs 20, 27 says, The Lord gave us a mind and a conscience, and we cannot hide from ourselves. I don't think it's on your notes. You can write this down. and It's not original to me, but it is a great way to say it. When we... When you and I, when we're running from our guilt, it's going to catch up with us. If you're running from your guilt, it's going to catch up with you. So we stay busy. We can even do a lot of religious activity in order to balance out the guilt we feel in our lives. 1 John 1 8 says, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves. Everybody circle, fooling ourselves. And not living in the truth. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. I'm reminded of uh, being in a conference a number of years ago, and it was a bunch of pastors. We all stood, and they were telling about all the different countries they were from, and and then it was time, like we do, to turn and greet one another. And so the, um, the leader of the conference said, turn and tell somebody next to you what is your greatest sin. <laughs> so, uh, I'm reminded of my friend Wayne Benson. He loves to tell preacher stories. He listens to Joel Olstein and others. And then he brings and tells me the jokes. And uh, so here's the idea of it. Three pastors were out in a boat one day. And they said, oh, it's time to get on us. So they started sharing their sins. And one said, I have a problem with gambling. Another says, I, I have a problem with drinking. And the third says, I can't wait to get to shore. I have a problem with gossip. <laughs> when you're running from your guilt, it's going to catch up with you. Listen. Do you know this to be true? We human beings have an am amazing ability, an amazing ability to lie to ourselves. Have you noticed that? In order to stop defeating myself, I must, I have to stop deceiving myself. Now, I went out and did a survey on the street to find out what problems we might have in our lives here in Green Valley, and if you're a guest today, um, you too. And I'm teasing about the survey. But uh, let me just give you a few ideas because centuries ago, there was uh, 
a monk in the fourth century after Christ, and he kind of put together this little list, and they became, over years, what we call the seven deadly sins. So I just want to bump on them a little bit, because uh, we have kind of our ones that we point out in other people, and then we kind of miss ones in our own life. You see what I'm saying? So here's one area of sin. Um, one of the seven deadly sins is greed. Anybody here have a problem with greed? Don't, don't raise your hand. I'm just kidding How about raising your hand. Greed, um, how much is enough? Just a little bit more. I want some more. I want some more. I want some more. Could I just give you an encouragement this week to meditate on Psalm 23, verse 1? Just take the first verse. The most famous psalm in the book, and it starts out with, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let me put it in modern language. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need. And if the Lord comes along and throws in bonuses, just take it as a bonus. Don't, think, don't take it as a right. The Lord is my shepherd. Greed. I better go faster. Gluttony. Let's move on. See, wait, that, oh, man. Lust. Lust is an excessive desire for anything. Lust is I want more, more, more. Laziness. I love the old, the uh, King James calls laziness slothfulness. Slothfulness. And if you know anything about a sloth, they, they move very slow. Wrath, which is where we get anger as well. Wrath and anger. Envy. We look at somebody else and say, how come they got what I don't have? I, they, I want what they got. They got position. They got possessions. And then last but not least is pride. So those are just seven kind of categories for sin. You all right out there? David gave us a prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Now, I'm going to suggest something to all of us in the house. And that is that uh, sometime in the near future, if you haven't done this, and uh, I, I say, you know, we should do it on a regular basis. I've encouraged men in our men's retreats. Sometimes this is one of the main things we do or one thing that we do during a weekend. And that is to do a spiritual house cleaning. And uh, if you, uh, whether you live in an apartment or I, I think of the ladies at, at the Freedom Center, they, they got to share this big room and uh, all together. I mean, it, that would be tough. I, oh, boy. Uh, but wherever you live, don't you sometimes go, I need to go through here and kind of like clean the place up, right? A spring cleaning. So I suggest that we should sometimes do a spiritual spring cleaning. And to take time and step aside and say, God, would you, would you speak to me? What are some issues? What are some things in my life that I'm not coming clean on and I need to talk about? And uh, if you would like, I've got... Several, but I got one in particular. Uh, if you'd like to uh, get a little tool, spiritual health tool, I'll be glad to send it to you. Write something down on a care card and how we can get in touch with you. And, of course, if you happen to put your name on the care card saying you wanted the tool, we'll obviously know you're one of the sinners in the house. <laughs> um, but I want to suggest that this is a great thing. It's a spiritual exercise to let God do some house cleaning. And uh, so if you like that, just make a note of it, put it on a care card, turn it in. I'll make sure somebody will try and send it to you this week. Get it? So I must admit that I have a problem. Do you have any problems in your life that you know you got to work on? Are there any issues or faults or... Uh... Okay, well, this is one of those really open Sundays. Anyway, number two... Years ago, I used to love it. People, uh, uh, I, it was such a touchy thing. I met a lot of people years ago, and they would, they really loved it. If I, if, if we call people, we have an altar call and invite the sinners to come forward, and all the saints would stand back and watch them. And to be honest with you, the saints never wanted to come forward because they felt as though somebody would think they have sinned. 
truth of the matter is, we're all in this together. And uh, we don't want to get the Pharisee thing going where, boy, I'm glad that sinner got down there. We're all in this together. So number two, number one, admit I may have a problem. Number two, accept responsibility for our stuff. Toughest thing I ever do, you might ever do. No excuses. I accept responsibility for my stuff. I recognize my faults and I'm conscious of my sins. I suggest take Psalm 51, which was a psalm by David and it was his confession to God. Psalm 51 and make it your prayer this week. Just pray it through slow. Maybe it's yours to pray. But accept responsibility for our stuff. Instead of blaming others, being lame, rationalizing it away, own it. Say, that's my responsibility. Number three, what do I do with my guilt? Ask the Lord God to forgive us. Ask the Lord God to forgive us. If we freely admit that we have sinned, we find God utterly reliable. He forgives your sins and makes us thoroughly clean from all that is evil. Isn't that good news? If we freely admit that we have sinned, God will stomp on us, throw us to the curb, and then try and fix us later. Is that what he does? No. If we freely admit that we have sinned, we find God utterly reliable, and he forgives our sins and makes us thoroughly clean. Let me just quickly give you a few examples of how not, the wrong way to ask for forgiveness. When you ask God for forgiveness, number one, don't beg. Oh, please, 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 pretty please, please, oh, please, God. Just ask. Don't beg. Don't bargain. You know, if you'll only forgive me, God, then I promise I will never do this again. How many have ever said that? <laughs> if you'll forgive me, I will never do this again. Don't bargain and the fact is, you can't keep yourself from doing it again. It can come down the pike again. So let me just uh, point this out. Confession, asking forgiveness from God, does not change the future. It forgives my past. And today we're talking about our past because that's the place we have to start in order to have a healthy relationship with God. We're talking about our past. Now that... The idea of changing bad habits, which some of you, some of you just really have bad, bad habits. I, I know you personally. And, uh, but this morning, we're not talking about changing our habits going forward. We're just talking about how do we get the past behind us. You've got to put your past behind you. You got it. So, don't beg, don't bargain, don't bribe. God, if you will just get this cleared up. I promise you, if I win the lottery, I will give you 10%. <laughs> so we don't beg, bargain, or bribe. What do we do? We just believe. Believe in what or who? We believe in the God who provided for us through Jesus on the cross. All of us have sinned, yet God declares us not guilty. Why? How? If we trust in Jesus Christ who in mercy freely takes away our sins. How you doing? We gotta draw this to a conclusion. When we put our trust in Jesus, it says he freely, freely gives us mercy to take away our sins. Now I know that there are many of us, we're good, we're okay, but there's some in this room this morning and you're thinking, you know, uh, Dennis, you have no idea what I've done. How could God forgive me? How could God forgive me? Well, you are right. I have no idea. But everybody, listen. Otherwise, there's no hope for any of us. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. Now, you, I'm not talking about consequences going forward, but it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. What matters is what Jesus has done for us. So I have no idea what you've done. You have no idea things I've done. But it's what Jesus has done, not what, no matter what you've done. Oh, you have no idea. It's bad. How bad is it? Oh, it's really bad. I want to just tell you, it did not surprise God at all. When you messed up, 
God the Father didn't go, I didn't see that coming. What a surprise. He knows that we are frail. He knows that we're going to have some struggles. And yet Jesus said, no matter what, he said, Father, forgive them. They committed the greatest crime, the greatest sin ever in history. They didn't know what they were doing. They killed God's son. And Jesus still prayed, Father, forgive them. Number four, here's the last one. What do we do with our guilt? First of all, we admit we might have a problem and we accept responsibility and we ask the Lord to forgive us. By the way, I encourage you to do that. A lot of people get stuck. They don't just take it on to the next. You got it. Just ask God to forgive you. But the fourth one, admit your faults to another person. Admit your faults to each other, to one another. Tell somebody about your issue. Tell somebody. Now, I just want to be honest with you. There are many people in this room, and you've never done that with your issue. Never. <coughs> you will struggle all the days of your life unless you find a trustworthy person. It says in James 5.16, admit your faults to one another. Now, it doesn't say admit everybody else's faults to each other. It says admit your faults to one another. And to pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. Yeah. Healed. Healed. Now, I'm going to go through this quick, but this is so good for us. This is really big. Listen. You do not have to confess your sins to another person to be forgiven. You only need to ask the Lord God for forgiveness. You don't have to confess your sins to another person. You only need to ask God for forgiveness. If you want to be forgiven, you tell God. If you want to feel forgiven, then you need to tell one other person. See, some of you have asked forgiveness of God, but you never told anybody else. And so you're carrying this thing around, and, it's, it's a, and, the, and the enemy just beats you up. Now, let me just submit. You do not tell your stuff to a crowd like this. And I got stuff, and you're never going to hear about it. And you don't tell your stuff to just anybody. But you, you, that's the reason we need to uh, gather together in small groups and support each other. And in that, you might find somebody. Now, let me just tell you, it's just one person, and I, I've shared with other people. But uh, I drive over almost every week and visit my dear friend and elder, Dr. Don Phillips. And at times, I've said, you know, doctor, I've never told this to anyone before. And he goes, yes! <laughs> now why does he do that? Because he knows I'm about to have healing in my life. And some of you have been carrying the issues of your life but never have felt forgiven. You have to be wise. You need to find a safe person, a safe place, and a safe time. But you need to find somebody that you can share your issues with. Well, you're just, I'm not going to do that. I'm not telling you to. God did. I'm not telling you to. God did. So we ask God for forgiveness, and we're forgiven. But we don't feel forgiven. Why? Because we need somebody in the flesh that we can kind of go, oh, you know, i got to share this with you. And it says, admit your faults one to another, to each other, your faults to them, and their faults maybe to you, and pray for each other so that you will what? Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. God has wired us this way. We only get well in community. Forgiveness comes from God and healing comes from other people, from relationships. Why do I need to do this? Because the root of all our problems, listen to me, is always relational. It's always relational. Now, we men, we are good at going to our cave and hiding out. We better than the ladies are good at, we're not going to let anybody in close. But the issue is that of relationship. Okay, how you doing? We'll wrap it up. There are two kinds of people in this world. Just want to make it clear. There are two kinds of people. People who are broken and have sinned and know they have, and people who are broken and have sinned and won't admit they have. 
Are you following me? Yeah. Did you get that? We only get well in community. Getting free. Getting free. So what does Jesus do with my guilt? Just fill in the blanks. Here it is. Jesus forgives instantly. When I ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins, my sin, he forgives instantly. It doesn't, by the way, mean that everything is copacetic. I love that new word, huh? Going forward, it's not going to be all ironed out. But when you ask him to forgive you, you are forgiven on the spot when you sincerely by faith put your trust in him. Second thing, Jesus forgives completely. Now, for me, I like to forgive in part. Oh, I forgive that. But you're not getting off on this one. Jesus forgives completely. The Lord has, it's as if I've never, he doesn't bring that one up again. The Lord has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? And the verse that follows that says, the Lord is a father to his children. So he doesn't come when we ask him forgiveness and he forgives us completely. He comes to rub it out, not rub it in. It's gone. It's gone. He's not bringing that up again. We're the ones that bring it up. And then Jesus forgives repeatedly. Obviously, he said, Peter came and said, how many times have we got to forgive him? And they asked. And Jesus said, 70 times 7. In other words, don't keep track, just keep forgiving. Jesus forgives repeatedly, and Jesus forgives freely. By the sacrificial death of Christ, we are set free. Our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God. And uh, I think it's the last verse on your notes. What happiness. How many would like to have a new joy and happiness in your life? What happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven? What relief for those who God has cleared their record? How do you spell relief? R-O-L-A-I-D-S. F-O-R-G-I-V-E-N. Forgiven. Forgive. Forgive. Let's stand together. Isaiah said this, all we are like sheep and we've gone astray, we've wandered away. That's what is such good news, though we've wandered away, Jesus never quits seeking us out. And it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Without God's mercy and grace through Jesus, None of us would be left standing. And God wants to work in our lives in a way to bring us to a whole new place of life and health and healing. Now, some of you are going to walk out the door and maybe you'll hang on to the notes. Maybe you won't. But God brought you to today. You are here, not by an accident. God brought us together for a reason. And you are sitting here standing now and you may think, man, I think he's talking to me. I'm sure he's not talking, but I think he's, I, I guarantee you there's more than you, guarantee you. But the issue is, the question is, what are you going to do with your guilt? Try and bury it? How's that working? Blaming others? How's that doing? Beating yourself up? Does that work? What are you going to do with your guilt? And men, I put the challenge out for you. What are you doing? Now, my point is a simple one. God wants us to be the healthiest uh, free, moving, and keeping a clear conscience. In fact, this is my verse of the last couple of weeks. It says, Paul wrote to, it's in your notes, I think. Paul, writing to his young disciple pastor, Timothy, and he says, cling to your faith in Jesus and keep your conscience clear. Some, having deliberately violated their conscience, have shipwrecked their faith. And some of you, you've gone that way. And Jesus, the good shepherd, saying, come on back.
Come on back. Come on back. I guess this would not be a message to say, if you're a sinner, come to the front. <laughs> but it is a message to say, Lord, we want to live in all of the grace and freedom that you've provided. Forgive us for hanging on to our junk, to our stuff. Forgive us. Because what you have in store for us is far greater than what we think we have by hanging on to our stuff. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I have no clue. I don't even can't comprehend putting my son up as a sacrifice for anybody else. But you gave your son, for you so loved us, the world, that you gave your only begotten son, that if we put our faith in you through your son, we won't perish, but we will have abundant life, everlasting life. For you, Jesus, didn't come to condemn us. You came to give us freedom and life and salvation. So, Lord, I pray you'd help us that we would be quick to deal with the junk, that we would uh, not be burdened down by our guilt. But you are as enthusiastic about forgiving us and cleansing us and putting us forward in freedom. You are all for us. And what a culture we live in. What a day we're in. But help us to keep our eyes on you. Come, Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, and apply your mercy and grace on all of our lives this day. And for those that stand here today and there may be that issue that maybe nobody else knows about, I pray this day they would have the courage and the faith to say, I want to deal with it. I'm going to bring it to you, Jesus. I'm going to begin to settle this thing, my past, so I can move on with my future. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining with us today in our streaming of our service and our message. We're grateful that you joined with us. And if we can serve in any way, we'd be glad to do that. Just check out our website. That'll get you connected in any way that you might like to. And uh, that is greenvalleychurch.net. And we wish you the best and know that you really do matter to God. Have a great day.